Section 9 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. Martin. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 1, Section 9. Letters to Her Sister by Abigail Adams To Her Sister Ottawa, 5th September, 1784 My dear sister, Ottawa is a village four miles distant from Paris and one from Passy. The house we have taken is large, commodious, and agreeably situated near the woods of Boulogne, which belong to the king, and which Mr. Adams calls his park, for he walks an hour or two every day in them. The house is much larger than we have need of. Upon occasion, forty beds may be made in it. I fancy it must be very cold in winter. There are few houses with the privilege which this enjoys, that of having the salon, as it is called, the apartment where we receive company, upon the first floor. This room is very elegant and about a third larger than General Warren's Hall. The dining room is upon the right hand, and the salon upon the left, of the entry, which has large glass doors opposite to each other, one opening into the court, as they call it, the other into a large and beautiful garden. Out of the dining room you pass through an entry into the kitchen, which is rather small for so large a house. In this entry are stairs which you ascend, at the top of which is a long gallery fronting the street, with six windows and opposite to each window you open into the chambers which all look into the garden. But with an expanse of thirty thousand levers in looking-glasses, there is no table in the house better than an oak board, nor a carpet belonging to the house. The floors I abhor, made of red tiles in the shape of Mrs. Quincy's floor-cloth tiles. These floors will by no means bear water so that the method of cleaning them is to have them waxed, and then a manservant with foot-brushes drives round your room, dancing here and there like a merry andrew. This is calculated to take from your foot every atom of dirt and leave the room in a few moments as he found it. The house must be exceedingly cold in winter. The dining-rooms, of which you make no other use, are laid with small stones, like the red tiles for shape and size. The servants' apartments are generally upon the first floor, and the stairs which you commonly have to ascend to get into the family apartments are so dirty that I have been obliged to hold up my clothes as though I was passing through a cow-yard. I have been but little abroad. It is customary in this country for strangers to make the first visit. As I cannot speak the language, I think I should make rather an awkward figure. I have dined abroad several times with Mr. Adams' particular friends, the Abbeys, who are very polite and civil, three sensible and worthy men. The Abbey de Mably has lately published a book which he has dedicated to Mr. Adams. This gentleman is nearly eighty years old. The Abbey Chalot, seventy-five, and Arnaud about fifty, a fine, sprightly man who takes great pleasure in obliging his friends. Their apartments were really nice. I have dined once at Dr. Franklin's, and once at Mr. Barclay's, our counsel, who has a very agreeable woman for his wife, and where I feel like being with a friend. Mrs. Barclay has assisted me in my purchases, gone with me to different shops, etc. Tomorrow I am to dine at Mr. Grand's, but I have really felt so happy within doors, and am so pleasantly situated, that I have had little inclination to change the scene. I have not been to one public amusement as yet, not even the opera, though we have one very near us. You may easily suppose I have been fully employed, beginning housekeeping anew and arranging my family to our no small expense and trouble, for I have had bed linen and table linen to purchase and make, spoons and forks to get made of silver, three dozen of each, besides tea furniture, china for the table, servants to procure, etc., the expense of living abroad I always supposed to be high, but my idea was no wise adequate to the thing. I could have furnished myself in the town of Boston with everything I have, twenty or thirty per cent cheaper than I have been able to do it here. 
Everything which will bear the name of elegant is imported from England, and if you have it, you must pay for it, duties and all. I cannot get a dozen handsome wine glasses under three guineas, nor a pair of small decanters for less than a guinea and a half. The only gauze fit to wear is English, at a crown a yard, so that really a guinea goes no further than a copper with us. For this house, garden, stables, etc., we give two hundred guineas a year. Wood is two guineas and a half per cord, coal six levers, and the basket of about two bushels. This article of firing we calculate at least one hundred guineas a year. The difference between coming upon this negotiation to France and remaining at The Hague, where the house was already furnished at the expense of a thousand pounds sterling, will increase the expense here to six or seven hundred guineas, at a time, too, when Congress has cut off five hundred guineas from what they have heretofore given. For our coachmen and horses alone, Mr. Adams purchased a coach in England, we give fifteen guineas a month. It is the policy of this country to oblige you to a certain number of servants, and one will not touch what belongs to the business of another, though he or she has time enough to perform the whole. In the first place, there is a coachman who does not an individual thing but attend to the carriages and horses, then the gardener who has business enough, then comes the cook and the maitre de hotel. His business is to purchase articles in the family and oversee that nobody cheats but himself, a valet de chambre. John serves in this capacity, a femme de chambre. Esther serves for this and is worth a dozen others. A coiffeuse, for this place I have a French girl about nineteen, whom I have been upon the point of turning away, because Madame will not brush a chamber. It is not the fashion, it is not her business. I would not have kept her a day longer, but found, upon inquiry, that I could not better myself, and hairdressing here is very expensive unless you keep such a madame in the house. She says tolerably well, so I make her as useful as I can. She is more particularly devoted to mademoiselle. Esther diverted me yesterday evening by telling me that she heard her go muttering by her chamber door after she had been assisting Abby in dressing. Oh, mon Dieu, tis provoking. She talks a little English. Why, what is the matter, Pauline? What is provoking? Why, mademoiselle looks so pretty, I so marvelous. There is another indispensable service who is called a frotteur. His business is to rub the floors. We have a servant who acts as maitre de hotel, whom I like at present, and who is so very gracious as to act as footman, too, to save the expense of another servant upon condition that we give him a gentleman's suit of clothes in lieu of a livery. Thus, with seven servants, and hiring a charwoman upon occasion of company, we may possibly make out to keep house, with less we should be hooted at as ridiculous, and could not entertain any company. To tell this in our own country would be considered an extravagance, but would they send a person here in a public character to be a public jest? As lodgings in Paris last year during Mr. Adams' negotiation for a peace, it was as expensive to him as it is now at housekeeping without half the accommodations. Washing is another expensive article. The servants are all allowed theirs. Besides their wages, our own costs are a guinea a week. I have become steward and bookkeeper, determined to know with accuracy what our expenses are, to prevail with Mr. Adams to return to America if he finds himself straitened, as I think he must be. Mr. J. went home because he could not support his family here with the whole salary. What then can be done, curtailed as it now is, with the additional expense? Mr. Adams is determined to keep as little company as he possibly can, but some entertainments we must make, and it is no unusual thing for them to amount to fifty or sixty guineas at a time. More is to be performed by way of negotiation many times at one of these entertainments than at twenty serious conversations, but the policy of our country has been, and still is, to be penny-wise and pound-foolish. We stand in sufficient need of economy, and in the curtailment of other salaries I suppose they thought it absolutely necessary to cut off their foreign ministers. But, my own interest apart, the system is bad, 
for that nation which degrades their own ministers by obliging them to live in narrow circumstances cannot expect to be held in high estimation themselves. We spend no evenings abroad, make no suppers, attend very few public entertainments, or spectacles as they are called, and avoid every expense that is not held indispensable. Yet I cannot but think it hard that a gentleman who has devoted so great a part of his life to the servants of the public, who has been the means, in a great measure, of procuring such extensive territories to his country, who saved their fisheries, and who is still laboring to procure them further advantages, should find it necessary so cautiously to calculate his pence, for fear of overrunning them. I will add one more expense. There is now a court mourning, and every foreign minister with his family must go into mourning for a prince of eight years old, whose father is an ally to the king of France. This mourning is ordered by the court, and is to be worn eleven days only. Poor Mr. Jefferson had to his away for a tailor to get a whole black silk suit made up in two days, and at the end of eleven days, should another death happen, he will be obliged to have a new suit of mourning, of cloth, because that is the season when silk must be left off. We may groan and scold, but these are expenses which cannot be avoided. For fashion is the deity every one worships in this country, and from the highest to the lowest you must submit. Even poor John and Esther had no comfort among the servants, being constantly the subjects of ridicule until we were obliged to direct them to have their hair dressed. Esther had several crying fits upon the occasion that she should be forced to be so much of a fool, but there was no way to keep them from being trampled upon but this and now that they are a la mode de Paris, they are much respected. To be out of fashion is more criminal than to be seen in a state of nature to which the Parisians are not averse. Autul near Paris, 10th of May, 1785 Did you ever, my dear Betsy, see a person in real life such as your imagination formed of Sir Charles Grandison, the Baron de Stael, the Swedish ambassador comes nearest to that character in his manners and personal appearance of any gentleman I ever saw. The first time I saw him I was prejudiced in his favor, for his countenance commands your good opinion. It is animated, intelligent, sensible, affable, and without being perfectly beautiful is most perfectly agreeable. Add to this a fine figure, and who can fail in being charmed with the Baron de Sale? He lives in a grand hotel, and his suite of apartments, his furniture, and his table are the most elegant of anything I have seen. Although you dine upon plate in every noble house in France, I cannot say that you may see your face in it. But here the whole furniture of the table was burnished and shone with regal splendor. Seventy thousand liters in plate will make no small figure, and that is what His Majesty gave him. The dessert was served on the richest china, with knives, forks, and spoons of gold. As you enter his apartments, you pass through files of servants into his antechamber, in which is a throne covered with green velvet, upon which is a chair of state, over which hangs the picture of his royal master. These thrones are common to all ambassadors of the first order, as they are immediate representatives of the king. Through this antechamber, you pass into the grand salon, which is elegantly adored with architecture, a beautiful luster hanging from the middle. Settees, chairs, and hangings of the richest silk embroidered with gold, marble slabs upon muted pillars, round with wreaths of artificial flowers in gold and twine. It is usual to find in all houses of fashion, as in this, several dozens of chairs, all of which have stuffed backs and cushions standing in double rows round the rooms. The dining-room was elegantly beautiful, being hung with gobian tapestry, the colors and figures of which resemble the most elegant painting. In this room were hair-bottom mahogany-backed chairs, and the first I have seen since I came to France. Two small statues of a Venus de Medicus and a Venus de Esmus Payne for the other name were upon the mantelpiece. 
The latter, however, was the most modest of the kind, having something like a loose robe thrown partly over her. From the Swedish ambassadors we went to visit the Duchess Donville, who is mother to the Duke de Rochefoucauld. We found the old lady sitting in an easy chair, around her sat a circle of academians, and by her side a young lady. Your uncle presented us, and the old lady rose, and as usual gave us a salute. As she had no paint, I could put up with it, but when she approached your cousin I could think of nothing but death taking hold of Hebe. The Duchess is near eighty, very tall and lean. She was dressed in a silk chemise, with very large sleeves coming halfway down her arm, a large cape, no stays, a black velvet girdle round her waist, some very rich lace in her chemise, round her neck, and in her sleeves, but the lace was not sufficient to cover the upper part of her neck, which old time had harrowed. She had no cap on, but a little gauze bonnet, which did not reach her ears, and tied under her chin, her venerable white hairs in full view. The dress of old women and young girls in this country is detestable, to speak in the French style, the latter at the age of seven being clothed exactly like a woman of twenty, and the former have such a fantastical appearance that I cannot endure it. The old lady has all the vivacity of a young one. She is the most learned woman in France. Her house is the resort of all men of literature, with whom she converses upon the most abstruse subjects. She is of one of the most ancient as well as the richest family in the kingdom. She asked very archly when Dr. Franklin was going to America. Upon being told, says she, I have heard that he is a prophet there, alluding to that text of scripture, a prophet is not without honor, etc. It was her husband who commanded the fleet which once spread such terror in our country. London, Friday the 24th, July, 1784. My dear sister, I am not a little surprised to find dress, unless upon public occasions, so little regarded here. The gentlemen are very plainly dressed, and the ladies much more so than us. Tis true you must put a hoop on and have your hair dressed, but a common straw hat, no cap, with only a ribbon upon the crown, is thought dress sufficient to go into company. Muslins are much in taste, no silks but lute strings worn, but send not to London for any article you want. You may purchase anything you can name much lower in Boston. I went yesterday into Cheapside to purchase a few articles, but found everything higher than in Boston. Silks are in a particular manner so, they say, when they are exported there is a drawback upon them, which makes them lower with us. Our country, alas, our country, they are extravagant to astonishment in entertainments compared with what Mr. Smith and Mr. Storer tell me of this. You will not find at a gentleman's table more than two dishes of meat, though invited several days beforehand. Mrs. Atkinson went out with me yesterday and Mrs. Hay to the shops. I returned and dined with Mrs. Atkinson by her invitation the evening before in company with Mr. Smith, Mrs. Hay, Mr. Appleton. We had a turbot, a soup, and a roast leg of lamb, with a cherry pie. The wind has prevented the arrival of the post. The city of London is pleasanter than I expected, the buildings more regular, the streets much wider, and more sunshine than I thought to have found. But this, they tell me, is the pleasantest season to be in the city. At my lodgings I am as quiet as at any place in Boston, nor do I feel as if I could be any other place than Boston. Dr. Clark visits us every day, says he cannot feel at home anywhere else, declares he has not seen a handsome woman since he came into the city, that every old woman looks like Mrs. H., and every young one like the D. Slash I. They paint here nearly as much as in France, but with more art. The headdress disfigures them in the eyes of an American. I have seen many ladies, but not one elegant one since I came. There is not to me that neatness in their appearance which you see in our ladies. The American ladies are much admired here by the gentlemen, I am told, and in truth I wonder not at it. Oh, my country, my country, 
preserve, preserve the little purity and simplicity of manners you yet possess. Believe me, they are jewels of inestimable value. The softness, peculiarly characteristic of our sex, and which is so pleasing to the gentleman, is wholly laid aside here for the masculine attire and manners of Amazonians. End of section 9 Recording by J. Martin